You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, Adrian. Hello, Will and David. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys for having me. And hello to our listeners and welcome back to our special Common Descent podcast spotlight mini series, where we take a break from our normal format of discussing scientific topics and instead focus on some scientific people in our favorite field of science. For this mini series, we have chosen the theme of invertebrate paleontology. And today we are joined by paleontologist Adrian Lamb. Adrian, if you would please introduce yourself to our listeners. Yeah, so I am a PhD candidate, so that means that I'm getting a doctorate degree currently um, at University of Massachusetts Amherst in Amherst, Massachusetts. And your specialty, at least these days, you are studying foraminifera, right? Correct. I study this little group of protists called foraminifera. Excellent. And now, uh, astute listeners may have already spotted the inconsistency here. We said the theme was invertebrate paleontology, and technically speaking, that means we're kind of cheating uh, talking about forams. Uh, if you would, just for any of our listeners who don't know, what are foraminifera? Yeah, so foraminifera are single celled protists, and they live in the open marine environment. Um, some of them, the benthic foraminifera, they can live in beach environments and also in the deep marine environment. So they can occupy a bunch of different habitats. They're really useful for a bunch of different reasons that I think we should get into later. Um, but for my research specifically, I work with the planktic foraminifera, the ones that live in the upper part of the water column in the open ocean settings. So they're living in about the, the top 200 meters of the ocean. And so they're part of that, that planktonic soup that... The, the whole mess of plankton that animals feed on. Exactly. And they're really cool because they, like I said, they're only single celled, but they secrete this calcium carbonate test. Calcium carbonate is just the material that seashells that you would find on the beach are made of. Um, so when these things die and they only live a few weeks to a big, maybe a month, a little more, once they die, those shells fall down to the bottom of the seafloor and collect there. And those shells are what I'm studying that, I study the dead plankton, the ones that are fossilized. Right, cool. right. Now, studying foraminifera, I've seen foraminifera, you know, when I took, you know, intro geology class because geologists love forams. <laughs> and foraminifera, you know, Will and I have talked about working on, on the main podcast on microfossils. And when we talk about microfossils, we mean microvertebrates, which are things that are small, but if you want to see the details, you, got, you need a microscope. Right. But if you're studying, you're studying actual microfossils where you, you're, you must be in front of the microscope all the time. Yes, yes. Uh, for the past probably four to five months, I've been, I go into my lab and that's exactly what I do. I go right to my microscope and I'm there for, I don't know, six, sometimes eight hours a day. It's oh, wow. really without the microscope. I can't do my research. I can't see what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things are... The planktic foraminifera at their largest are about the size of a grain of sand. Um, so you can see them with your eye, but that's all it looks like is a piece of sand from the beach. But you really need to get kind of in their faces. They don't really have faces. They're not animals. <laughs> you know, fun, but uh, you really have to get up close and personal with these things to really determine what type of species you're looking at or what you're really even looking at in the first place. So yeah, they're super tiny. So what is your research focus? What are, you, what are you specifically looking to learn from these tiny critters? Um, there's two main things that I'm focusing on for my dissertation. So for my research, for my PhD right now. The first one is evolution of planktic foraminifera. I love looking at evolution and how species change through time. And what, what external drivers in the Earth's system, for example, changes in water currents, changes in water temperature, drive species to speciate, to create new species. So specifically, I'm working with the last about 23 million years of Earth's history, period called the Neogene period. And right now I'm working with a lot of foraminifera in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. 
Um, I'm working with three, what we call sites that cut across the Crocio current extension. So these sites are places where a drill ship goes out, sits in the water and drops down a pipe and drills sediment core from the seafloor. So these three sites that I'm working with, they're just sediment cores that were taken from the seafloor across this western boundary current. So one site is to the north of this current where the water is pretty cold. One site is directly under the Crocio current extension. And the third site is to the south of it in kind of really warm water. So my working hypothesis is that these big western boundary currents, so all of us are on the east coast right now of the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. um, and our closest western boundary current to us is the Gulf Stream. So western boundary currents occur in all ocean basins, and the Crocio current is just the Pacific equivalent of the Gulf Stream. So these are really dynamic systems. These currents are always changing. They bring a lot of heat and moisture from the equator up to these mid-latitude regions. Locally, they control precipitation patterns. So they're really important to, to us. To a degree, they control weather, and on a longer term, longer scale, they control climate a bit. But it's also interesting to study the animals and the plankton that live within these systems. So it's not really well understood how or if these western boundary currents, these places where you have mixing of really cold water and really warm water, if that contributes to evolutionary processes within these plankton. So that's the first hypothesis I'm looking at. So the second hypothesis is actually the western boundary current itself. I'm looking at when, when did the current form in the first place come into its modern configuration, and how has that current changed across warming and cooling events in Earth's history? So today, these western boundary currents are moving a bit um, towards the poles. So the Crocio current extension is moving towards the North Pole. But to what magnitude is that, is that shift going to happen? So that's what I'm trying to quantify by looking at changes in these currents in geologic time. So in deeper time, when the Earth was a bit warmer than today. So we can say something. We can use the past changes in the current to say something about how the current may behave in the future under human-induced climate change. All right. That's fascinating. By looking at the previous patterns, we may be able to predict kind of what the upcoming ones might be. Exactly. And that's one way to look at it. And people have also done modeling studies of these currents. So actually taking computer models, heating, heating the Earth up, which just means they add like an increased amount of CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas in our atmosphere, to that model system, and they see how these currents behave. And they've come up with a few different hypotheses as to how they'll behave, but we also have direct measurements and observations from the past decade or so that indicates that these currents are changing as Earth is warming. Now, how do you use the forams to track the currents? That's a really good question. So there's two main ways. So we actually have a pretty good understanding about what species of forium occurs across these western boundary currents today. So scientists can go out and do these things called plankton tow studies, where you actually go out in a boat, you throw a net over the side, and the net is small enough that it will capture the plankton. And you tow that net back up, and you can look at the number of species that are there and quantify, kind of look at the species in that sample, and you can say, who, the species, is occurring in what spot along this current. So we have a really well understanding of what species are occurring in the middle of the current, what species prefer cooler waters that would be to the north of the current, and what species would prefer really warm waters that would be characteristic of the south of that current. So we then, so we understand the present day distribution of these forams. So we then look at the fossil record and go back in time and we see those same species or species that are related to the ones that are alive today in our oceans, we can use those, the numbers of those, of them, number of species, so their abundances, um, but also the presence of certain species themselves to tell us something about how that current has changed. So that's one way I'm doing this. The second way is to use what we call isotopes. Right. So we actually dissolve the shells of these little foraminifera, the calcite, I don't wanna to get too technical about it, but we use their shell chemistry to tell us something about the changes in water temperatures through time. If we see, for example, in the northernmost site that I'm working with, that's currently today north of the Crozier current extension, if I look at the shell chemistry 
of these Planckdick foraminifera in deeper time. And I see a time where the forums are telling me that sea surface temperature got warmer. That probably indicates that that current shifted to the north a bit, and it's bringing warm waters to the north with it. If I see the temperature through time get really cold, then that current probably shifted towards the equator, so south a bit more, bringing more cooler waters over at that site. So okay. I'm using those two different proxies, these two different methods to kind of test how the current changed through time. Very cool. And we mentioned in our micropaleontology episode that that's a, a common usages with these, these shell forming little organisms. Mm -hmm. Their shell, is, the composition of their shell will be dependent on what's around them, what the temperature's like, what the environment's like, because they've got to build it from what's available. Exactly. And that's so useful to us. It's, yeah, it's amazing. I would think that there are lots of organisms that, that you could look at in the water that can tell you about past, you know, temperature change and, and current shifting and things like that. Mm -hmm. What makes forams so good for that? Yeah, so forams are the best. And I'm not saying this because I'm biased. I am a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> They're the best. Yeah, to be honest, uh, they are the best group to look at these water mass changes and changes in ocean temperatures and productivity, so the amount of nutrients in the water column, because they, um, the mass in which they occur in our oceans today and in the geologic past. So foraminifera have been around, at least the planktic foraminifera that I work with, uh, for about the last 165 million years. And when they first evolved, they spread really quickly. So they occur everywhere, pretty much. They have a global distribution. Um, they occur in high numbers in our oceans. And they have a short lifespan, so as soon as they die, their shells fall and collect on the seafloor. So when I take, so for example, when I take samples from these sediment cores that I work with, it's only a 10 centimeter squared sample. It's very small. But within that one sample, I can have thousands, tens of thousands sometimes, of foraminophil. There's so many. So I never, I never have a shortage of fossils. I'm I probably leave work literally covered in them sometimes. <laughs> They're just so abundant, and that what, that's what makes them so, so useful for us. They're so easy to obtain, and they're everywhere. And this is one of the big differences, and I think we've mentioned this before on the podcast, but this is one of the big differences between vertebrate paleontology and non-vertebrate paleontology. Like, we, we get super happy if we can find, like, 10 skeletons of something. Right. <laughs> You've got thousands of programs, which is fantastic. Exactly. It's a totally, vertebrate paleontology is a totally different world. And even in vertebrate paleontology, you can still find, sometimes, um, your fossils in great abundances. So, for example, I did my master's thesis in Ohio. And I worked with Ordovician-aged invertebrates. So, the Ordovician occurred about 400, 450 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was working with brachiopods and trilobites. And I wasn't really working too closely with the actual specimens themselves. I was actually taking other people's data and doing uh, modeling to see how they would have dispersed across continents through time. But when you go out in the field in Ohio, you can go to any road outcrop where there's gray rock, and it is just totally filled with hundreds of brachiopods, and you can just pick them up all day long. It's fantastic. <laughs> Great. Speaking of collecting, can you tell us a little bit more about what it's like to collect your foram data from the ocean floor? Yeah. So these sediment cores that I've been talking about, I was actually had the opportunity to go out on a ship last summer for two months and collect cores with a team of scientists. So we were sailing on this ship. It's called the Joides Resolution, and it's one of two major drill ships that's used almost exclusively for scientific ocean drilling. So there's a drill rig on the middle of the ship. And originally the ship was built to drill oil. It was built in 1951, I believe in Canada, but that's when the oil market kind of crashed. So instead they retrofitted the ship to drill sediment cores. So today the Joyce's Resolution sails all over the world drilling ocean sediments. So what we did, we um, last summer went out to the Tasman Sea located between Australia and New Zealand and we had six places that were already picked out that we chose and that we wanted to drill into the Earth's crust and see what was there, essentially. So we picked these sites, and when we were over our site, the ship has a dynamic positioning system. It has, I think, six 
extra propellers that come down and the ship doesn't move. Even though there's like a bunch of waves hammering at us, the wind's blowing, the ship doesn't move. It's amazing. Wow. So what we're actually able to do is pipe, um, well, pipe, pipe down to the seafloor <laughs> and drop a drill bit in. And we actually drill and we bring up sediment cores from the seafloor. So my job on that ship uh, was to look at the fossils that were contained in the, each core. And I used these fossils to tell the other scientists on the ship how old the sediment was. So we were starting at the youngest sediment at the top. And as you go back down through the sediment, you get older and older. So everyone's really interested in age on the ship. It kind of puts everything else into context. So our job as paleontologists on the ship gets pretty intense. But it's really fun because you're watching evolution in reverse happen, which is amazing. So that's kind of how it's done. You go out, we went out to the middle of the sea. There was a team of 32 scientists and with staff, to support staff, people to cook for us, people that kept the ship clean, drillers, people that worked on the floor, or what we call the drill floor, where all the drilling is happening. All together, there's about 125 of us on the ship for two months. And it sounds awful, but it was really amazing. It was <laughs> the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. That does not sound awful at all. That sounds incredible. That yeah. Sounds really cool. Well, it's such a different, when you picture fossil sites, right? When you see fossil sites in the movies and they're out in the badlands and, you mm -hmm. know, Grant and Sattler are pulling up velociraptors and such. But to imagine a fossil excavation site in the ocean between Australia and New Zealand, that's such a cool place to be able to do paleontological work. Yeah. And not many people understand that. Yeah, so Jurassic Park kind of ruined it for all paleontologists, <laughs> at least for us invertebrate and microfossil paleontologists, because every time I tell someone, I'm a paleontologist, and they're like, oh, you look at dinosaurs, and I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, then I have to explain that I look at actually, like, dead plankton, and it doesn't seem as cool to them, which is unfortunate. But, yeah, our field sites aren't, you know, in the middle of the Badlands or in the middle of a desert. That's not what we're doing. We get to sail all over the world, and that's our, that's our fossil site. We drop a drill core in and then we literally pull up thousands upon thousands of fossils to study. And it's amazing. That's, that's also one of the things that, that I find very interesting about studying these, these microorganisms is that unlike studying a large animal, uh, you know, like a, a dinosaur species, you may, you know, with the dinosaur species, you may only have two or three sites around the world that, have that species because that's where they lived or that's where the rock's been preserved. But with the micro ones, they're everywhere. And so it's, it's a very different kind of game, which is uh, it's fascinating to me. Yeah. It's really crazy. Cause with, I know with vertebrate paleontology, sometimes it's hard to find specimens or have enough data, but to be honest, we have hundreds of sites that have already been drilled all over the world. And sometimes I feel like I have too much data. <laughs> <laughs> It can be wow. overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, we're we're just so we feel so bad for you with your mountains <laughs> of data. Yes, I know it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it stresses. So now that we've talked a bit about your research, we'd also like to ask a bit about your. You you are a fellow science communicator. Yes, and correct. You have a website called Time Scavengers. I do. Yep. Can you tell us what that's about? Yes. So it's Time Scavenger Stop Blog, and about a year and a half ago, me and one of my really great friends and colleagues, Jennifer Bauer, she just graduated with her PhD from actually University of Tennessee. Um, she okay. works with echinoderms. Yeah, so she works in deep time, so really old stuff and was invertebrates. And around the 2016 election, we kept hearing a lot of negativity related to climate change and we kept hearing phrases like people didn't even know a scientist or what scientists really did and they didn't understand um, the scientific evidence for climate change and that really annoyed me more than that it really made us mad yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so instead of just being angry and not doing anything productive I decided to channel that anger into something a bit more positive so I, came to, I went to Jen after I came up with this idea of building a website that really broke down and explained the concepts behind climate change and evolution too, because that's also a contentious topic. 
um, especially in the education realm right now. Yeah. I went to her and I said, would you want to help me with this? Oh, and she was thrilled. <laughs> so that was in December. And by January, we had organized everything and had started building the site. So we have static pages in the site um, that break down and explain in detail the science behind climate change and how we know global warming is a thing. We have evidence from the geologic record. We have direct measurements from today. Uh, we also have made pages that kind of do the same thing for the theory of evolution. We've kind of broken down that theory and explains some of the major findings behind it. The other cool thing about the site, though, is that we don't just have static pages to address the issue that a lot of the public on social media platforms were complaining that they didn't know a scientist or they didn't know what scientists did. We decided to create a set of blogs that would also kind of give the public a glimpse into our lives as scientists so that they could actually see what we do and see where we get our data from and how we use that data to make interpretations. So currently the website has all these static pages. I think we're up to about 35 at the moment. We have more plans that we're gonna build and write later. Um, but we also have six blog components right now. I'll just go through them quickly. One of them is specifically just for like climate and paleontology news, where we just take important papers that have been published and we just break down the science behind them and explain it to the public why that paper is important and the major findings that the scientists found. One of our other blogs is called Bite of Life. It's where we discuss our lives as scientists and we discuss topics such as imposter syndrome or the importance of mentors in our lives. We just kind of wrote that blog to connect with other graduate students and other academics, um, but I think the public can relate to it too and there's also blogs within that section that would be appropriate for you know, students that are thinking about going into science. For example, undergraduates that want to present at a conference for the first time or high schoolers that want to get involved with science and kind of see what it's all about. Uh, one of the other blogs that we have that's one of my favorites is called Meet the Scientist. So every other week we feature a new scientist and they just write up in terms that the public can understand what they do and how their science contributes to the greater good of humanity or to understand our earth in a more significant way. And then one of our other blogs is called Science Bite, and that's where we actually give people, the public, a glimpse into our lives, like what we do in the lab. So if I'm doing, for example, I'm dissolving the shells of the Foraminifera, this is where I would talk about it. Or if I'm working on evolution in these Forium lineages, I explain exactly how I'm doing that, just as an example. Or when we go and do museum work, what are we doing there? Why are we doing it? So we've had a lot of fun with these blogs. And I was never a blogger, but I've become a blogger in the past year and a half, and it's been fun. So it's, it's a website for the public so that they can kind of gain a better, deeper understanding about our Earth's history, about climate change and evolution, but then also really understand what it's like to be a scientist. And I really want people to realize that we're just humans too. So that's kind of what it's all about. I think it's really fantastic that you've combined th explaining the science on the same site that you're also explaining the people who are doing the science. Right. Because I think it's, I think you're right on the money that it's one of the barriers in the way of people's understanding of science is that scientists are kind of often thought of as these vague entities, you know, people hidden away in a lab somewhere. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's just as much a barrier to people, to, to the pub, the general public understanding the work of scientists as, you know, any technical misunderstanding. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we just want to show, you know, we're just, we're just human. So for example, I think in one of my blog posts, I talk about starting in community college after high school. I had no idea what I wanted to do. <laughs> I a geology course. I was never a straight-A student in high school. I actually skipped class a lot. <laughs> I hated it, but, and I hated math, but I've gone on to do statistical modeling during my master's. I work with coding all the time now, and I'm comfortable doing that. So the path to becoming a scientist isn't something that happens overnight, and it's just not, it's, science isn't just for one subset of the public. It's for everyone, and we really want to represent that. Um, especially through our Meet the Scientist blog, we really try to incorporate people from different marginalized groups and really give them a platform to talk about themselves and the science that they do. We also really want to show the public 
and anybody that's interested in science that you can look like whoever, whatever, and you can still do science. It's okay. I really appreciate you pointing out that not every scientist had, had a, you know, it's shining scholar career with science just all the way from beginning to end, you know, because that's one of the most common questions I get from parents that whenever at the, when I was at the museum, but also at the aquarium now with a kid who's interested in the subject and they're wondering on how to get to it and they'll come up and they'll be like, all right, so what do they need to take? What do they need to do to get here? And it's like, well, there's the common paths, but there's people here who have backgrounds in you know, accounting and ended up being the account, you know, accountant for the aquarium and now work in other aspects of it because that's, you know, they started diving because they were a hobbyist and now they help. So it's, it, I like that you, you emphasize that because that's something that very few people get to hear about. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the researchers at UNC Chapel Hill, she, I interviewed with her for my master's degree and she is one of the world's leaders in sclerochronology. So she uses the growth lines in these bivalves like you would find on the beach. Um, she does these like analyses on them and she can say something about the changing seasons in deep time. It's really cool. But she started out, I think she started out in banking. <laughs> and she, she was like, this is boring. I don't want to do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now she's like one of the world's leading scientists in paleontology. And it's, that was such a story that stuck with me through the years. Because you're right. It, you don't have to just know you're going to go into science, you know, when you're in high school or whatever. People come to, into science mm -hmm. from several different paths and different walks of life. It's really quite cool. It, it's, it's so, for how it's portrayed, surprisingly diverse. Yes. And I think it's great. This is something that came up in episode 19 of our main podcast, uh, Selfish Plug. But we <laughs> talked about the, this idea of representation in right. science and that having a website where you could just go scroll through a list of scientists mm -hmm. and say, okay, mm -hmm. this is what scientists look like, like real scientists, and this is where they come from, and this is what they do is way more important than a lot of people give it credit. Just to be able to see what real life scientists look like and to hear their stories is so important for encouraging people who are either young people thinking about getting into it or old people thinking of getting, you know, people who have been mm -hmm. banking for however long and, and want to get into it. That's a really essential service that you're providing. Yeah, thanks. And that's something we want to continue doing is just representation, you know, Maybe there's not a lot of people in color in the geosciences right now, but they're there. And we want, mm -hmm. people, we want to showcase them and show kids that you can be a person of color and you can still do science and you can still be awesome at it. You can come from a different country and still do awesome science. It doesn't matter your religion. So yeah, that's, that's really important to us. And I think a lot of people in the geoscience community and yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Representation is so, so important. And, and the only way to adjust the, the imbalance is to represent it, is to, exactly. to represent those people. Definitely. And how has the website been going? How has it been received? Have you gotten feedback from people? We do. So we've gotten feedback in several different forms. When we first made the website live to the public, I think we posted the link to the site in a Facebook group. Maybe it was March for Science. It was one of the big groups. And we got over 1,200 likes. And a lot of comments, people really liked it. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah, um, awesome. Yeah. So we've also applied for um, some small grants from like the Paleontological Society. And we just won one of the grants to do education and outreach work because, you know, keeping up a website costs money. Yeah, um, congrats. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but the other thing that we're doing with the website, we're not just doing education outreach. We're also doing education outreach research. So we, okay. keep, we run Google Analytics on the website. So we have user data from when the website was released. And we use that data um, to tell us when visitors are visiting the site, where they're coming from, the languages that they speak, the browser that they use, um, their age, their gender. So this is all stuff that we've been just kind of calling this past year and a half. And it's been really great. So basically, uh, what we've seen is an uptick since last January in the number of users that have visited our, visited our site. And last January, what happened was Jen and I, up until that point, were just like texting each other every day, like, what are we going to release today? What post are we going to release? What do we need to write? 
And then we got tired of that because it's exhausting and we're, we're graduate <laughs> students. So, right. you know, franticness doesn't really work well into a grad student schedule. So we sat down in January and um, decided that we were going to make a schedule. We made a Google Drive folder. We released, we decided we would plan out what we were going to release every month and we talk via Skype or Google Hangouts at least twice a month and plan out what we're going to do. And ever since we started doing that, the number of users per day has slowly and steadily increased, which has been really cool. That's great. Um, yeah, so we really get great, we've gotten great feedback from people directly. Google Analytics is indicating that we're doing okay, we're doing pretty good, our <laughs> user base is growing, which is what we want. Um, we've been gaining an audience from all over the world. A lot of people come from the US, but people are also finding our site through organic searches on Google. So when they're searching climate change or isotopes or foraminifera, they're finding us, which is really great. That's exactly what we wanted. That's so it's, excellent. Yeah, thanks. It, it's cool. been good and it's, it's still good, I think. Great. I will That's tell awesome. you, uh, this, is, this is a little behind the scenes info for the listeners. And also I haven't mentioned this to Adrian and I don't think I even told Will this. Uh, <gasps> when we were trying to find people to interview for this series, uh, Will and I are vertebrate paleontologists. We don't know a ton of invert folks. Mm -mm. And one of the places that I went to look for ideas was your Meet the Scientists. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I scrolled down the Meet the Scientists list looking for invert, because I don't know invertebrate paleontologists very much. Right, right. Yeah. So it's good, it's good representation among scientists, too. So oh, fantastic. Right. That's great to know. <laughs> cool. I'm glad it was helpful for you. <laughs> So That's listeners, sweet. check that webpage out. It's very useful and very informative. Thanks. One last thing that we wanted to ask before we wrap up, we are doing these interviews over the summer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've been encountering is that it's hard to schedule meetings with scientists over the summer. <laughs> and A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and in your case, we know that we have caught you the week before you're going off on a trip. Uh, yes. Can you tell us what, what about, a little bit about what you're doing this summer? Sure. So the big trip that I'm taking this summer is to Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, it's for a scientific meeting. So a couple times a year, there's these major meetings that scientists attend, and we attend these meetings to share the data that we've collected, um, our major results that we've interpreted from that data, and just to network with each other. And it's also kind of fun just to hang out and just like seriously nerd out with other scientists, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. You guys understand. Um, oh, yeah. So this is a meeting and it's called Foriums 2018. So it is a meeting all about Foraminifera. People from all over the world are going to be there and it's going to be great. So for about a week, um, we're just going to have talks. People are going to share their research on Foraminifera, benthic and planktic. Um, there's going to be a poster session. So people will have posters up of their research. And during the middle of that conference, we actually get to go on different field trips which is really great. Um, so we're going to visit the Isle of May where there's a bunch of puffins. I'm so excited about that. Oh, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's really awesome. So that's the first trip we're going on. The second trip that is kind of in the works, um, we may, we being me, my advisor, and one of my lab mates, um, we may drive out to Kansas and sample this core. So it is a core that was taken um, not from the ocean, but on land, it was just drilled through this rock called the Eagleford, and it's of Cretaceous age. So the Cretaceous is when the dinosaurs were like having their heyday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So during this time, in the middle of the United States, there was actually a seaway called the Western Interior Seaway. And my lab, my advisor, Mark Lecky, is really involved with looking at the water mass changes within the seaway and how the Foraminifera changed during this time within this area. So oh, this Eagleford core is from the Western Interior Seaway, and we would be sampling it to look at the changes in these Foraminifera species through time on the eastern edge of the Western Interior Seaway. So that's hard rock stuff, and I don't really mess with a whole lot of hard rock stuff because I do marine sediments that aren't rocks yet. So kind of looking forward to that. It's going to be fun to see a core that's rock core, not sediment core. That's um, exciting. Yeah, so that's scheduled. Well, it's not scheduled yet, but we're thinking we'll go later this summer. So those are my two big trips. <laughs> Other than that, I'll be in my lab doing work. <laughs> yes. Well, you're also you're working on 
eventually finishing up your PhD. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, yes. as we understand, uh, more and more and more work until the end. That's right. Just tons of work, which is fun. I love it. So it's fun work. Excellent. As, you know, they say love what you do. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So important. Well, Adrian, we have had a wonderful time speaking with you. And if our listeners have also enjoyed this conversation, where might they find you on the vast internets? So they can find me on Facebook. We have a Time Scavengers page. They can like and follow our page um, to see blog updates. We also have a Time Scavengers Twitter account. We're at Time Scavengers. And I also have my own uh, Twitter account. It's at 4 a.m. Whisperer. So like the horse whisperer, but 4 a.m. Whisperer. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. Yeah. So you can reach me there on those three platforms, those three places. Yeah. So if you have any questions about forums and things like that, you can reach out to Adrian and we'll put all those in the the description of this episode. Awesome. I had to say, I I like your naming of things. Time scavengers is a great name. 4am whisperer is a great name. (laughs) (laughs) They all hit me like random times, you know, when I'm in the shower, washing dishes, I'm like, Oh, that's a cool name. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, That about wraps up this conversation. Uh, Listeners, we hope you're enjoying this trip through some of the people in invertebrate paleontology. This is part two of our series and there will be more to come. So thank you for listening and we hope you'll join us next time. And one final big thanks to you, Adrian, for joining us. This has been great. Yes, thank you guys so much for having me. I've had a ton of fun. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Well, we will let you get off to preparing for your trip to go talk forums and see puffins. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Busy, busy summer. Have fun. Thank you. (laughs) And listeners, we will see you next time as our series continues. Bye for now. See you then. That was great. Thanks for listening to the common descent podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.